Welcome to Tuesday Night, The Refinery, Episode 14. I am your hostess, Leslie P., and we also have our host, J.D., other hostess, Felicia Cravens, and our hosts, too many S's, um, Corey and Andy with the Party of Choice. And today we're going to start out by letting Corey and Andy take it away and talk about what they've been doing. Just go. It's just been really, really busy, and it's a really good thing. Um, we Let's see. Back a few weeks ago, we were able to go to the Americans for Prosperity Conference down in Dallas, and that was really great. We had a chance to break into a new market to um, show everybody what the party of choice is all about, and it was just great to have so many people come up and ask us, so what is this all about, thinking that you know it was all about abortion. <laughs> When really, you know, it isn't. It's all about taking that word back because it's been branded as only about abortion. And um, had some really interesting conversations with people, but the majority of them were super positive. They'd come over and they'd be like, what is this all about? And um, just give them the 15 second spiel, and then they'd stay and talk for 10 or 15 minutes. So it was really fun. And I think the thing that struck me the, as the most interesting about the AFP conference was the number of trolls that we encountered. In fact, at the I, conference, at the conference, um, they were pretty easy to pick out because they were very confrontational. They only wanted to argue. They wouldn't listen. They cut you off, and um, a lot of anti-fracking people were there, which I thought was interesting since it was Texas and it was a conservative conference. So, well, that that being in Dallas, maybe it was a target from the battleground Texas people. It could have been, and you know what's really interesting is that. I swear, one of the guys who came over who was anti-fracking was at the Western Conservative Summit. <laughs> I, I swear it was the same guy because he used the same line. When he came up to our table here in Denver, he looked at our I freaking love fracking bumper sticker and he goes, seriously? And I said, what? And he goes, you love fracking? And I said, yeah. And we started talking about it. And then he just walked away. He didn't really want to get into it. And then in Dallas, I looked up, I recognized him. And he said the same exact line, verbatim. Well, well you know, it, in the political contests from two years ago and four years ago, they talked about how there were trackers of the opposition following candidates along. I suppose if it's something that they do for candidates, then in off years and, you know, in other, at other times of the year, they're going to go to our conferences. I mean, we go to theirs. Mm -hmm. um, so... They probably are traveling conference instigators or trackers or whatever we want to call them. Yeah, I think, that, I think they were. And it was funny because he kind of recognized me too. He could see like <laughs> hesitation in his eyes after he said, seriously, you love fracking? <laughs> <laughs> At which point you just say, well, what, what, what Soros group do you work for? I know, and right? I just sure ask him. Knows better. They're paid community disorganizers. It's yeah, good. I like that. So, icky. Yeah, so we, we encountered some of that, but overall it was a super positive experience, and um, we had one young man who kept coming by our table because he liked the Heath bars, and um, I just kept giving him handfuls. I was picking him out of the, the bin for him. And then he came back later, and he's like, I'll help you out. You look tired. So he sat down behind our table, and he's like, I don't know what I'll say, but I'll just tell him you'll be back in a little bit. <laughs> So, Andy, how did you feel about this young man following your wife around like that? Uh, I liked him a lot. He was great. Yeah, he and Andy bonded over football at lunchtime, so it was <laughs> <laughs> He was a great guy. Yeah, so then he got his friends to come over, and they loved watching the ads and and just really had a lot of fun talking politics. So That's something I'm, I'm, I'm really curious about. Uh, I mean, the reason that you guys are here you know, going down the, the road is because of the I'm a conservative uh, ad. Mm -hmm. I saw it on Facebook, you know, a little over a year ago. And, you know, after that sort of escalated into we have to find these guys to we found these guys to now we're on the refinery together and we're doing this show every week. Um, I so uh, how, how was that? How was that received? Um, I, I hope you guys were playing it like nonstop because that's... Yes. Ad. Yeah, well, what we did was we had Stian, our producer, put together a loop of all of our ads that we've done so far. Ten of them. So we had ten ads, and we played them on our little TV, and they just constantly played the entire time. 
And it really drew a lot of attention because people saw the war on women and then Aslan, of course, um, standing there and they'd stop and listen. And the freaking love fracking would grab a lot of people's attention, especially young people. They loved it. They thought it was hilarious. Um, and people really, really liked the I'm a conservative ad. I've been impressed. Sorry to sound a little impressed with myself, but <laughs> with Andy, just as far as how far this ad has gone. When we put it together, we thought it was good, but we didn't think it was like the best thing ever. So a lot of people think that it's refreshing. So that's good. Well, Corey was very cute in it. Well, is is Corey ever not cute? I just I, I, I remarked. I remarked on this at the time when we were there. I kept it was so compelling to me because every time she says, "Or my views on sex," I just I crack <laughs> up. So funny. You know, one Corey. The only time she's not cute if you wake her up at like 3 a.m. Did you ever see the movie The Ring? <laughs> no. This, yeah, this, you're climbing out of the, the well. Andy, 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 drop the shovel. <laughs> Drop the shovel. We know you love tracking. Tracking. Drop the shovel. Bro tip. Bro tip. Right there. there the go. rest of the time. The rest of the time, she's not in black and white. And it, really, the rest of the time, awesome. I love you, honey. Uh, I'm glad that I'm glad that the ad got a lot of play, and I'm I hope that everybody goes and and checks that out. Uh, searching uh, the party of choice on on YouTube and and watches those ads. I'll link them in, uh, in searching YouTube. I'll link them in the uh, in the description for the for the clip that will no doubt be uh, made of this. Um, aside from the ads, uh, you know, what about the engagement there? How how um, how many people were just coming up to the coming up to to the booth for that? Oh, you're about choice. And and how did those discussions go? It was pretty predictable, actually. Um. Usually what they do is they kind of walk past and they look at you out of the corner of your, their eye and they're not sure if they want to come over and talk to us or not. But if we can smile and get them to come over and chat for a few seconds, their whole demeanor changes. Because at first they're so skeptical and they're just like, choice. What do you mean choice? And then we explain because conservatives want people to have more choices. Liberals want to take choices away and control them. It's a real study in how well my old side has taken over that word. Oh, absolutely. I would have. I would have assumed that you were a pro-abortion group that, or a pro-choice group at a conservative thing, and I wouldn't have talked to you. Yeah, mm -hmm. they. They. Um, it is amazing to see. We're, we're talking about you know the Democratic Party. We're talking about people who hate choice with a passion that cannot possibly be matched. They oppose. They despise it at almost all levels, and yet they use the word so well that we were questioned badly. I mean, you know, people would doubt us right out of the gate. Uh, we, Corey even had to troll with that. We, we had some where they would come and just attack us over abortion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had this one older man. He was 80, and um, he told me he was 80. But he came over and he asked, he's like, so what do you mean the ch choice? How do you apply that to abortion? And I said, well, I believe that the unborn are our life, and so I think that one choice shouldn't take away another person's choice, and so that's why I don't support abortion. And he ripped into me, I mean, just screaming at me in my face, and there was a lady and another man standing there who were trying to jump to my defense. Um, and it was kind of funny because he was just so irrational. He wouldn't listen to us, let me even finish the sentence. But then he asked me if I knew how many um, eggs were in my ovaries. And at that point, I'd had it. And so I actually got right back in his face. And I don't normally do this, but I shouted him down. And I told him he was not going to say another word until I finished at least one sentence because I had listened to him for the last five minutes. So he did stop talking. I did get my points out there. And then he just started yelling again. And so at that point, another man who was standing there, he pulled him aside to try and calm him down. <laughs> but um, then when the troll left, the man came back and talked to me. He's like, that guy was nuts. He's like, I don't know what his problem was. But so. you see, I saw true marketing potential in the whole concept. I mean, you ever see when people will put, like, a jar of jelly beans on a table and you guess how many are in there? Gosh. Yeah. Oh, well, God. Just, guess I, how many I, eggs are in Corey's over here. Okay, we're going to mute this people now. People would guess. <laughs> and, 
<laughs> and then we'll have an ultrasound machine so that you can count them. <laughs> And we gave out prizes at the end. It was, you know, I made up the number naturally. But, you know, but it was fun, and people, it was family fun. Oh, my gosh. And I learned it from that wise old man. <laughs> J.D., oh. I will kill you if you put this on. <laughs> yeah, cut, cut, don't print. Uh, okay. Me. Suffice it to say, this will not be, this, this is, this has uh, wound itself up on the cutting room floor. Yes. Anyway. Um, oh, come on! Don't you, don't you think one of the great clips from this episode from this episode no. should be how many eggs are in Corey's no. ovaries? Oh my God, no! <laughs> I can't breathe! I can't breathe! We, we, the wrongness is so wrong. We, we, we're ten minutes into this and, and we've already completely derailed. <laughs> okay, let me, let me, if, okay. I, if I may, if I may, get back away from the ledge for a sec. Please. Dear God, please, please. <laughs> No, but uh, hey, I thought it was funny. Yeah, you. <laughs> well, funny. obviously, so do we. But, um, but the the really I interesting thing is is the way Corey was disarming, and she would have party of choice is really about. Yeah, there she just <laughs> commented on me there. Uh, one thing the party of choice is all about is how we can unite the right, how we can disarm hate and anger. And she did that as much as you can. And and when you had a troll come up and would not be disarmed because they were there to be angry, Corey was so disarming, other people would take the trolls aside, which that's, I think is pretty cool. That's always huge when you can get the. I mean, and that's and that's indicative of how effective your arguments are. You were able to get the audience to uh, side with you against the troll. And pull them away. I mean, that's that's huge. That's a huge win. Yeah, it was. And you know, you asked how people re responded to us, and those were the extreme cases. But overall, we had so many people who are just very curious, wanting to know what is this all about. Um, and they loved it. They loved it. They would, their eyes would light up. They'd smile real big. They'd go and they'd get their friends. They'd bring them back to the table. They came back for more literature. They asked if they could have extras. Um, it was just a lot of fun, and it was really encouraging, too, just to see the hope in their eyes, because once it clicked, and it didn't take long, once it clicked and they realized, you know what, that's right, that is our word, we want to take it back to, how do I do that? And then we could point them to our website, to the ads, to Facebook, to, you know, any of the literature that we had, and they were just so excited. It was really fun. Well, and the, to me, the great thing about the choice versus control message is that once you understand that the conservative libertarian philosophy is about providing individual choice and progressivism is all about control, that concept can be applied in any topic. I mean, it's not like you have to study and prepare. Any topic that a progressive brings up, you can just fly with a choice versus control paradigm and you're on it. Exactly. And, yep. and so it's a it's a tool that they can carry with them and use for any topic any topic that comes up. Right. And when I would explain that to them and I'd say no more memorizing 50 topics, 20 talking points per topic. You can just listen to what they say, ask a few questions, find common ground, even though it seems impossible, you can do it, and then just start talking choice versus control, which makes you the good guy. It's like a weight just went off of their shoulders. The one that they really seem to dig the most and get into the most, sorry, dig. I'm 51, okay? It was groovy. Groovy. <laughs> the one they liked the most was uh, talking about how to disarm people regarding the war on women. Yeah. They went nuts for that. As I just explained, okay, somebody's angry at you. They're angry. Here's what you say. Here's how you bring it down in just a few seconds. Boom. And 30, 40 seconds later, they were just almost every time they were like, oh, my gosh, they're not that angry anymore. I said, yep, and you can do that on almost every topic. And it was it was fun. It was fun watching the light in their eyes. It just was so fun because, you know, people up in Colorado, they know us, you know. And it was really neat just seeing new people say, wow, I'd never heard that before. Yeah. Oh, and we had one person come up. This was really fun. He, he walked over to our table and said, the party of choice. I know you guys. I listen to you on the radio. <laughs> and I was like, all three times, huh? 
<laughs> and um, it turned out he was one of the AFP volunteer winners from Colorado. And he listens to Chris Cook's show on Grassroots Radio, and so that's how he was familiar with the party of choice. But that was really neat, and I kind of teased him later that I needed to ask for his autograph since he was so famous. <laughs> <laughs> or pay him for his marketing. That too. That works. <laughs> That's awesome, but again, Fishy really has, has wrecked us here on the refinery by not getting you guys to sign the uh, non-compete while you were in Aspen. Yeah, true. Uh, or Dallas, I'm sorry, Dallas. Uh, so, um, yeah, just just terrible. Um, you know, getting back to the guy who who's We have to pretend we're all happy for their success and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Right, because you know, we never talk about you guys and yeah. you're our best friends or anything. <laughs> <laughs> getting, getting, um, getting back to the guy who was, who was trolling uh, you, Corey, um, was, he, was he going from the point of principle? Like, because that's, that's something that, that uh, I would imagine you guys face often. Uh, when it comes to oh hearing the hearing the word choice, people on principle rejecting it, uh, is, was that something that you faced? No, that's what was so strange about it because all he wanted to do was fight. Ah. He he didn't. I was expecting that because I tried all of the usual arguments and talking points that we use, and none of them were working. So, um, for instance, when he asked me what I believed and I told him what I, where I stood on abortion and pro-life. He said, see, you pro-lifers are all the same. You don't even care about the woman. And I said, well, actually, yes, I do. And I said, it sounds to me like maybe you just don't believe it's a human life until a certain point of development. And he wouldn't even listen to that. He just started yelling at me and saying, well, my wife should have the choice and my daughter should have the choice and who are you to tell them that they can't choose? And I said, I'm not telling them that they can't choose. It is legal if that's what they choose at this point. Then that's a legal choice. However, I am pro-life. I would hope that they would, uh, you know, be open to listening to my point of view because, you know, I do believe it is a human life, and I think it's always good to hear another perspective. And he didn't even want to go there. That's at that point. That's when he asked me the egg question and everything else. So it just went downhill from there. Okay, because I, I had no idea. I, I didn't realize that was an actual. This is that was it was a uh, pro-abortion uh, person that you were dealing with. I thought it was somehow just a, another. Because we have on on the right, we have a lot of people who will object to certain things just based on that word on principle. Oh sure, and, and we did have some of those people. Those tended to be more of the libertarian hardcore Tea Partyers. Um, and Andy's better at talking to those people than I am. Um, just he's got better points than I usually can think of, so I usually turn them over and, to him. And she always shoves them at me when I'm eating. <laughs> you gotta right. have a chaser. You gotta have a chaser. I hold up one finger. Just excuse me. I'll get there. It doesn't go well. <laughs> awesome. You know uh, it's. It's interesting because the, you know with the um, the discussion that I was having on Facebook with the guy that you talked about after the recent article, his big issue. Hold hold up hold up hold up. You can't you can't just do that. You can't you can't let him you know jump right into that. You need to let's, actually, let's talk about your issue. Let's talk about your article. I speak in scattered words. I select them and just throw them out there. Every sentence is and none of them are thought out. Absolutely, but no, you have a you have a new article out on on the party of choice on the party of choice dot com, and I I, I want to hear about it. So, so uh, let's let's intro it up. What's uh, what's the new article about there, Andy? I'm sorry. <laughs> the article is about how sorry I am. Um, by the way, the guy's heavily pro life. Uh, the article is called Wolf Hunt, and because I'm an ex Democrat, uh, ex liberal, and I knew a lot of liberal. Um, activists. Um, and also we talked with our lawyer some and he, he deals with them downtown. They actually hire them to go on websites and to go to places as, as trolls. I mean they're, they're paid. And so what I did was talked about the wolf in sheep's clothing that Jesus talks about in Matthew and uh, basically brought that forth to today about the wolves that are in sheep's clothing amongst us, amongst the conservative movement and how they are here 
and they'll portray anyone. They'll portray somebody who's Tea Party, somebody who's establishment, somebody Christian right, somebody libertarian. They don't care. They will. They are paid. They will come among us to rouse up the troops, the, the troops, to be angry at each other and cause division. Because, and I guess the big thing I wanted to get through to people is the only goal of the wolf. You know, we all we all debate on our principles. Oh, you know, you're not enough like me. I'm not a. All the wolf cares about is one thing, numbers. How can I draw, drive numbers away from the Democrats' most viable, politically viable opponent? That's it. They only care about that. They don't care about anything else. And for conservatives, that's really hard to understand because we want to be we, we debate principle. They don't care. And so what I wanted to do is kind of just take people inside the world of the, of the wolf, know how they think, know what, they, what they're about, and know how to expose them. So that's what I wrote. Of course I'm muted, so I can't, I can't even speak. No, I, and, and it's a... The, the thing that I, I thought was, after I read it, that word, the P word, principle, is something that gets us in so much trouble sometimes, you know, where you will have people come up and say that, no, I can't vote for this guy because of principles and not get into exactly, you know, how not voting and helping the Democrat win, you know, boosts in any way, shape, or form the principles that they have. You know, getting to how principle, you know, they're saying that it's, princi it's more principle to stay home than it is to go and vote for somebody. But, you know, they, they somehow fail to realize that if the guy who's running as a Republican isn't winning, that their principles most likely will be being diminished. Their values, the stuff that they want to have happen, go away uh, if the liberal gets gets elected. Well, and like Leslie has reiterated so many times, there's a complete difference in principles and the tactics and strategies that you use to get there. That's a, that's a different thing altogether. And if people are equating the two, it's easy to see them you know, stand up and walk away rather than think through those harder issues. How do I get that thing, those principles advanced? Right. I mean, um, and basically, I mentioned that at the end of the article. Another thing Jesus said about dealing with wolves is that um, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves, and you must be, um, how did he put it, as innocent as sheep or as innocent as doves and as shrewd as serpents. In other words, you can't just be principled like the dove. You must be strategic like the serpent. You must be shrewd. You can't just sacrifice winnable seats in New Jer in, in New I mean in uh, Delaware. Okay? You can't throw away the Delaware uh, seat and say I'm doing it for principle. You know, one big principle people always forget is the principle of winning. And the principle of winning is very simple. It goes like this. The, the winners will govern the losers. It's just like gravity. Drop something, it will fall down. You can't say, I'm a principled person, and then ignore gravity. Okay? Another principle, you spend more money than you have, you'll be in debt. Try ignoring, but, but I wanted to be principled and give to this ministry and to that candidate and to this thing and to that thing, and now you're a thousand bucks in debt. You ignored another principle. Um, there are base principles that you cannot ignore. You cannot ignore the principle of winning and say you're principled. And that's no. very key. We, and I wonder in your in your discussion of the wolves that are among us and that are paid infiltrators, um, and they're pretend. You're saying they're they're pretending to be one of us. Yes. And we, we won't know. We don't know. No. That they are infiltrators. No. They're, and, and, what are, are they are they geared at trying to find out about us and report back to you know are they like spies trying to report back and then no. use use that against us or are they looking to get in and divide us from ourselves and also then to be maybe over the top tea party conservatives to make tea party conservatives look bad by being so over the top anti immigrant uh, or whatever well, two things. First of all, you know, not everyone's a wolf who is divisive. Yeah, you know? true. <laughs> no, don't think that I'm well, saying. Sure, 
Fox. This is, this is an Andy that coked up paranoiac saying, everybody, everybody they're all against you. You know, <laughs> um, They're all fakes. They're all Soros plants. Right, right, right. But uh, I will say this. No, they're not. They're not spies to learn about you. They already know all your talking points. They know all about you. Okay, they get them from listening really to um, the easy way. They they do it by listening to Rush, listening to Mark Levin, listening to and to the establishment leaders. You know, listening to you know, McConnell and stuff like that. They are there for one reason and one reason only. Only one. They target who is the um, most viable opponent to the Democrat. And how can I decrease the number of votes going toward that person? And they may pose as a they may pose as a um, let's say the candidate is um, an establishment person. They may pose as an establishment person and say I support him and go on blogs and say I support this you know this guy and then rip on all the Tea Partiers to anger them into not voting for. They may pose as a Tea Partier, rallying the troops, saying, "We have all, you know, we've all been told that we have to, you know, uh, 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 vote for the lesser of two evils." Well, we've done that in the past. Look what it got us. Not this time. We're taking our stand for principle, as JD said. It's principle. They can pose as anything. They don't care. Remember, the ends justify the means for the left. They don't care how they do it. But to know that they are there, you only need to know two things. I mentioned this in the article number, about the left. Number one, they have endless resources. They are wealthy. They are absolutely loaded with money. And the people who are loaded with money on the left, be it Soros or guys like that or people out of Hollywood or people who run you know, telecom you know, uh, companies, they will spend their money on politics, much more so than even like the people on the right. So the first thing is that they've got unlimited resources, and the second thing is they have no conscience whatsoever. And I can tell you that for sure, having been raised by the left. No conscience. They do not care. They don't, they don't care because they believe that what they're doing is right. America is wrong. It must be brought down. This is how, and they believe it's right. And they will do anything and say anything in any group. And so... My basic message to people is, you know, first of all, I give them some, you know, easy ways to, you know, locate wolves, which is kind of fun. That's why I call it wolf hunt. I, I always had fun doing it on the blogs. Um, but also just to understand that person next to you at the tea party meeting or at the establishment meeting or wherever that's rousing you up against the other side may not be one of you. Yeah. It's it's absolutely the case. You know that's that's something that that people don't really take into account. It's not something that people really think about. And it's something what we really need to do is we need to think about how does this help? How how does what we're doing help us succeed in uh, November? How does it get our principles, the ones that we that we uh, hold so dear? How does it advance our cause? Does it advance our cause to have a Democrat in office? No, it doesn't. It doesn't help our cause to have a Democrat in office. So, you know what? It, it is it is frustrating that that there are people out there, but I'm glad that you've given us ways to uh, identify and to uh, sniff out these wolves. Hopefully, more people will be able to you know take that advice, use it, and and remember. Hey, if this isn't helping our cause, then uh, what value? What value is it? What what value am I gaining by uh, agreeing with this guy who has a racist Photoshop of Barack Obama, or you know, is doing other ridiculous stuff? Because there are people out there whose, as you said, the their sole job is to make us look bad and to divide us, and they do a good job of it. Yeah. Keep in mind. I mean, there have been cases, documented cases of them going to Tea Party meetings with racist signs claiming, you know, acting as Tea Partiers. Right. Um, the, I think in the end, the last thing I'd want people to understand is this. If the wolves want to divide you, notice the wolves never come and try to unite you, <laughs> okay? Um, if the wolves come and try to divide you, then whether you ever see a wolf or not or discover a wolf or not, 
does it, doesn't it upset you that your division that you're pushing makes wolves happy? Right. And I think that's where, because as soon as you start talking about infiltrators or, or the wolves, then because people like to be competitive and conspiratorial and discover things, it becomes a focus to try to identify them. And the answer, the, the easy solution, and I'm, I'm a fairly lazy person and I don't really care if somebody is a wolf or is just a passionate and yet misguided true believer. Uh, my response should be the same. If they're totally over the top racist, I'm going to block them, I'm going to ignore them. Whether they're a conservative racist or a Democrat racist trying to pretend to be a conservative racist, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me what their what their source is. Um, they are a they're a disruptive bad influence and they're not helping me achieve my goals. So I'm going to ignore them if I must or try to persuade them if I can I guess or try to limit the amount of damage that they can do in terms of disrupting and dividing and I don't really care whether they're a wolf or just a misguided true believer. Exactly and that's pretty much how I wind up the article is as much fun as you know people like me like hunting wolves just because it's fun but you know we're weird. But, but how are you? It's like you know, it's like those blind items on TV Guide. How are you ever going to really know if that was the person? And if I mean, are you ever really going to find out for sure that this person you thought was a wolf really is? You know, in a few cases I have, but generally you don't know for sure. I mean, they never. <laughs> it's it's. There's been a couple times where yeah, they've actually confessed or whatever, but generally no. Yeah. Here, here's the big thing. Like you say, it doesn't matter if they are or not. I want people to know, number one, they do exist. And they are out here trying to rouse you up against one another. That's a given. Why wouldn't they be? They have endless money and no conscience. It would right. be ludicrous for them not to. Okay, But number two, um, don't if, if you simply don't allow them to affect you, and if you look at your own actions and don't do things that would make them happy, you've already won. You don't have to find anybody. Yeah. Um, give them nowhere for their seeds to grow. And they will go away. Or they'll stay and keep trying because they're being paid. One thing about um, like uh, wolves who are trolls on paid trolls on the um, on, on the websites, a lot of times they, they'll stay anyway and keep posting and trying. Why? Because they're being paid by, by the post and by the, the number of times they do these lists and, and talking points. So they have to keep doing it even when they're getting creamed. They don't have a choice. This is how they're making their money. Um, but it, it, it's I, – I had one guy who is one of the quote-unquote lead voices in Colorado for gun rights. And I cornered him on the phone and asked him some questions, and he came around and admitted – this is before during the 2012 election – that he wanted Barack Obama over Mitt Romney. What? Yeah. Yeah. And he, this guy, is on, yeah, I got to be careful. I can't give names or whatever. Um, Corey cautioned me wisely. I'll basically say, you know, this, this guy is known, okay? And, yeah, he admitted that. He fully admitted it. And, you know, it, it, it was really incredible. So you, you'd be amazed what's out there. But like I said, the main thing is, no, you don't need to care who they are or what. All you need to do is, number one, make sure they don't affect you, and number two, make sure you don't do things they would like. Yeah, and it's, it's like in any battle. Learn what, is, what it is that your enemy wants you to do. How, how does your enemy see his victory happening? And don't let him achieve that. And if the enemy the Democrats, see a victory over us by dividing us, by dividing us into Tea Party and Libertarian and um, true conservative and neocon. If, if they consider it a victory for us to divide, then we just have to not divide. Doesn't matter who they are or what they're doing. If what they want, if, if what they want is for us to be divided amongst ourselves, then we simply deny them that. And this comes back to being principled, the principle of winning. Mm -hmm. you right. You can't disobey the – look, you're in a political climate. It's about winning and losing elections. It's about who will govern the country, right? 
you can't ignore the principle of winning and say you're being principled. You're not being principled. You're being unprincipled. Because okay. the only way it doesn't matter who wins is if it's a libertarian country and the and politics doesn't rule our lives. But right now, progressive politics totally rules our lives. Right. Right. And you know, like like Jesus said, you know, I know, you know, I'm a Jesus guy, you know, but but like but his wisdom was undeniable in strategy. And like you said, not just innocent as doves, shrewd as serpents. You got you have to play to win. But I'm an atheist, so I must hate you and I'm a libertarian, so you know, my issues are more important than yours. And I can't be friends with you because I don't like the death penalty and you do. So we can't be good bros because of all those things. When the real reason why I can't be your friend is because the Packers came back from a 21-3 uh, <laughs> to beat me on Sunday. Um, okay, oh, where's the gong sound effect? That was a gong, sports discussion. Gong, we don't allow gong. sports here. No sports in here. I must. Uh, real no quick. <clears throat> JD on the death penalty. I got to be honest. While I support it, I don't absolutely massively love it as much as I lay it on thick when I talk to you. That is purely for fun. Absolutely, and 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 you know that's because that, if you that's, can't that's... joke about the death penalty, what the hell can you joke about? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie um, understands me. <laughs> I, I get you, man. I get you. See, this is this is why why we have just such good chemistry here. Um, Talking about how how uh, certain people who who have uh, been advocates of of guns uh, also can be advocates of Democrats. Let's talk about somebody who's received the blessings for, uh, of uh, of the NRA. Um, I, I just want to make a quick turn here to uh, to Harry Reid. Oh, gross! Some... What? <laughs> yeah, were you not aware of that, Andy? Yeah. He's yes, he's been endorsed by the NRA several times. The NRA is a single issue organization. If you're pro-guns, they are in favor of you. They don't care how, what your positions are on anything else. And they're very which clear is why, on that. Which is why I, one of the many reasons why I am not a member of the NRA and uh, why when I you know, have anything to do with guns and gun rights and all those groups, there are other ones that I support that, uh, that are not the NRA. Also, Wayne LaPierre is a fool. And does not know how to uh, to to talk to young people and to make the issue. If you're going to make an issue, if you're going to say guns don't kill people, people kill people, but then say that video games also kill people, somewhere in there your logic is at fault. Um, but the reason why I wanted to bring it up uh, was because there was just you know, you know right now, right now uh, the First Amendment is under attack. And there was an excellent piece by Kevin Williamson. You know, I'm not going to go into detail about it, but how is it that how are we going to talk to the general public about the stuff that uh, you know has been stuff that went on in Ohio about uh, the government trying to uh, make it so that you couldn't use particular types of speech. There's a lot of government restriction of free speech that's gone that's gone on recently from the Dems. How do we get these messages out to people? And um, how is it that we are not the party of free speech? You know, how, how, how do people not realize that we are the party of free speech? Nobody? Not a single person is commenting on this. I've been talking too much. <laughs> no, I... I I it's mean, I, I think it is. I'm sorry. It is amazing we blow that. Well, I think we don't know how to we don't know how to frame the argument, and it's that because I've seen uh, just a little bit. I have not paid that much attention to it, but just a little bit of the Democrat statements about it. You know, where they're posting about how horrible it is that the Senate blocked this legislation that would make politics fair. And we don't have a counter for that because fairness is good. Well, and I mean, they own fairness, or yeah, you know, we've allowed them to own fairness. 
it, it's it's it goes back to to Citizens United, of course, because everybody, you know, that's the the great Satan uh, that that the left wants to point out every you know every single time that there's an ad from from the Koch brothers that appears. Oh, hey, thanks a lot, Citizens United, you terrible evil people. Never mind all of the union funded ads that go out. Uh, you know that that were not affected by Citizens United, so um, somehow they've they've made the conversation instead about freedom of speech, they've made the the uh, conversation about political speech. They've made it about oh this is propaganda. Oh this is these are these are conservatives taking advantage of the system. So somehow uh, we are at fault. Because we want to allow corporate speak, and corporations are bad, and we want to say that corporations can speak freely, just like people or whatever. I mean, they're twisting, they're twisting reality as they do so well, and we're absolutely kind of just dumbstruck in being unable to fight against it. We can we can talk people through it if we get them for thirty seconds or forty five seconds, but we don't have we don't have a slogan against this ridiculous in, infringement upon the First Amendment rights to free speech. We don't have a slogan that sounds as cool as get the money out of politics, make it free for people, power to the people. We don't have anything as cool as that or as easy to understand as that. What they're doing is pretending that this is campaign finance reform. Kevin Williamson goes into this in his article. But what it is is about squelching speech that you know, the left doesn't agree with, obviously. And Ted Cruz waded into this argument in an interesting way. And I'm going to have to find the article, but what Ted Cruz was saying, and you know, you could argue whether this was a... Um, whether this was something that, that is a viable argument or not, but it certainly got uh, attention in a lot of debate, is it would criminalize some of the skits on NSL, uh, SNL, on Saturday Night Live, some of the things in a particular period, a particular window of politics, it would criminalize them because guess what? NBC is a corporation. Guess what? Those people on that stage are being paid to perform this. How is it any different from releasing a movie or a book, uh, you know, within a certain time period before an election? It technically isn't. That's a. I think that's a good way to go about it. And since we see progressive politics talked about and promoted in every TV show, I mean, my God, there's Green Week. Um, all of those would be illegal speech during that window prior to elections. So maybe the answer is to look at programs that were that were broadcast shortly prior to elections before and say this would have been illegal. Is that well, a is that a good message? If they were to balance it with Oil Week, I think that'd yeah. be good. I'd like that. Well, would they be illegal? See, that's the thing. Um, who gets to decide what's what's legal and what's good? That's the thing. That's the, the real question here. Uh, it could just be that you know the powers uh, that be think that Green Week is important and it's it's really good and it's not really a political issue. I mean, quite frankly, this is this is about saving the planet. It's a it's not a political issue. This is this is something that everyone has to be aware of. This is also something in, in legal terms it's called prior restraint too, where you're attempting to um, you know, stop actions before they happen um, with you know, injunctions and whatever. You want to, to prevent the thing from happening the same way that you would um, you know, by having a court issue an order against someone from taking a particular action. But this is a blanket prior restraint that says everybody has to abide by these standards and at the same time who's going to legislate that or who I mean not legislate that but who's going to hear that uh, judicially or administratively it won't be a courtroom it will be some panel in some bureaucracy of the administration under the auspices of the president that's not 
I'm sorry, there's no way you can classify that as uh, free speech and unrestrained uh, political expression. There's no way. Um, this is a scary thing. More people should know about it. More people on the left should be upset by it. At least always, in the middle, they should be. I always do a lot like, well, Ted Cruz is doing. I, I always remind people immediately, and I do this with young people too, when like the fairness doctrine was being tossed about, I would I would I would call talk about movie moderation. I'd say okay, but you got to make it anything that you know anything that is big corporation money putting out messaging has to be balanced. Okay, so Paramount, Paramount, every every single movie company has to put out equal messaging for the right and the left starting now. You can't just do it in this one area and then while you dominate all the other areas. And when I when I said that to young people, I got to be honest, they agreed. Because I'd say, and the view would have to hire two conservatives and two liberals rather than right now, which that what they've always done, which is three or four liberals to the one token uh, semi-conservative. You mean on like the view? That's yeah. What she said. Yeah, That's yeah, right. yeah, yeah. And say, Andy so, never listened to me. what? <laughs> Andy. <laughs> Listen, I just I get lost because I'm old and, and confused. <laughs> no, but you know when you look Bless at young people, heart. when you look at young people and and tell them that, let me tell you something. It does not take five minutes to bring them around. It is such a preposterous argument the left is putting out. It takes thirty seconds to bring them around. It really does. They they come around very quickly when you say, okay, but you can't just say balance the areas where the other side's doing well. You have to balance all areas that affect where big money affects political speech. And the biggest money affecting political speech is movies that take hundreds of millions of dollars to make. Okay, and, and you put out these super, um, what was that ridiculous movie that was like big time uh, save the earth type thing? Avatar? Yeah, Avatar. You, you're, you'll, you must put out use the exact amount of money, you know, Avatar costs, what, about $200 million to make, I think. And you must use that much money to put out a, a, a movie stating the other side. And, look, that, that took, like, you know, 15 seconds to tell a kid, and let me tell you, the kid will look at you and say, well, Oh, I see. Just like, just like they'll think net neutrality is a great thing, because the words net neutrality, that sounds really good. But then once you say net neutrality is letting the government decide what happens on the internet? Like, oh, hold on, wait. The same exactly. government that screws up everything they touch? Yeah, yeah, those guys. I'd, I'd like to know how we get com corporations in general, big corporations labeled as evil, but then we have GE and, and, and Paramount and Fox and all of these movie companies and power companies and, and product companies that are left approved, they've got the stamp of approval, um, uh, and then they don't get labeled as the same sort of corporations. Do you think people just aren't thinking that through all the way? Um, that there's a, a a good house wrecking seal of approval or something on these um, that allows the left to give them a pass? I think it's because young people like their products. Why do you think Apple, a huge corporation, is so popular among young people? And they're they hugely profit profitable, back. and their profit margins are huge, but then these same people say, oh, profit's bad, corporations are bad. Yeah, but they like the product, mm -hmm. so they're going to buy the product. They don't stop and think about where it's coming from. I don't think GE is a beneficiary of that. No, it's not. And there are some companies that, that, that do sponsor Democrats that um, are getting some heat. Uh, and people use a lot of their products. In fact, I'm using their product right now, and, and uh, Leslie brought it up. But Comcast and net neutrality, there's there's a lot of heat headed towards headed towards all of those corporations. But they're also benefit. You know, that's the thing that that people are not really looking at is that there are corporations on both sides here. There's, right. There's uh, Netflix. And the service providers on one side of this issue, and and then there are the pipeline companies 
like Comcast and Time Warner, which is going to be Comcast, uh, you know, on the other side. So it's it's just it's and and that whole issue, the net neutrality issue, is one that because of the regulations from the government, there is a real it's it's it is very much close to a monopoly as it is right now. Um, so there's there's some some really crazy stuff going on there. But right, regulations made the problem, so let's fix it by adding more regulations. More regulations. Just like we had regulations making our healthcare system a problem, so let's fix it by make um, so more, you know like yes. net neutrality is like the Obamacare of the internet. Sure, to to an extent, it's it's a it's a very general treatment to a problem that is very nuanced. So. Uh, would the the best solution be to repeal the regulations? Yes. yes. Is that going to happen anytime soon? No, probably not. So, I mean, that's that's something that I I hope is an issue that gets that gets tabled uh, for the time being. But um, you know, there that is a situation where there are two sides, and there are good guy companies, and there are bad guy companies. And somehow we we can't uh, figure out a way to extend that uh, that dichotomy out and, and figure out how to uh, make people understand that sometimes I mean that that this speech that that we're talking about that is protected needs to be constantly protected. That's not something that you can just pull the rug out from under the the uh, the feet of these guys. It's it's just it's outrageous that that people don't get that. But we can use these discussions to make them understand that. And I it's think. not just corporations. The article that Kevin wrote yes. talks about Susan B. Anthony List, which is a pro-life organization that wanted to put up a billboard and was prevented from doing so through all of these regulations. They, they pretty much prevailed, <clears throat> but the billboard didn't go up. So it's not just what's an official regulation. It's the the prior restraint they're encouraging that groups, businesses, individuals will impose upon themselves. Well, rather than get into that argument about do I want to take this bold step of putting up a billboard, I'm just going to save my money and do some more mailers instead. That's, that's the insidious part of this, is that it's causing people to restrain themselves and not to put their message, message out in the way they originally intended but to take a safer route in order to avoid lawfare essentially having to go through courts and legal um, challenges just to express themselves well and that, and that does go back to the CEO of Mozilla uh, getting drummed out of his job because at one point he made a political donation and it was because his political donation was made public and was used as a weapon against him um, and that's you know I used to be from the campaign finance reform standpoint allow everything but reveal everything you know allow every kind of donation don't put limits on anything at all but make the politicians uh, you know, publish all of their donors so you could know. Well, it's that publish point. I have a I have a right to donate to and do whatever I want with my money and with my voice, and you don't have a right to know about it. No, because if your vote is private and your donations are not, show that's how you private. Then I I always tell people your donations should be as private as your vote because mm -hmm. no. Nobody should be able to take the way you feel politically left or right and use it against you. That's private. If you want to speak it out there and you want to tell everybody, this is what I'm about, then that's your choice. But to have your donations or your vote revealed is wrong. Of course, we use all of that information uh, that we can. I mean, that's that's not that's that's something that we do. We we go out there and we seek out the. Uh, or at least I know I have. I've looked up um, who makes donations to what and uh, all of those those types of things um, because it's 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 out there. If it's out there, then you should be able to use it. But 
I agree. I think that it's something that we don't talk about anywhere near enough, that some things are free speech, some things you're out there and you're saying it, but you should be allowed to speak quietly. Mm -hmm. This whole thing makes me squidgy. Uh, on the basis of transparency, um, of knowing who funds an organization, um, I'm all about the publishing of who's donating. At the same time, we have politicized life so incredibly much over the past, uh, you know, decade or so that the left is using this information as weapons because they can, in marginal and small races and whatever, um, begin to marginalize people either through their donations or uh, through you know an organization through who donates to them um, because they tie people together and and sort of shackle them. Um, so that you're carrying around the, the albatross of you know one person's donation or you're donating to one cause and that sort of thing. I am very uncomfortable either way that this lands. I don't know where I stand on it. I am and I probably reflect the views of a lot of people in that. Um, I want to know who's funding what. I want to know who's getting money um, and, and how many politicians are, are getting, or organizations are getting money from big donors and whatever. Um, but at the same time, weaponized information like that is what it is, and mm -hmm. people are, you know, respond to it the way they do. I am perfectly sympathetic to Andy's viewpoint, especially knowing that I've read the blueprint in Colorado model, and it's exactly what they did there. And it's it's been a chilling of political donations and so many corporations and private businesses, uh, you know, privately held businesses, the owners aren't going to make their their political donations. They aren't going to sponsor the Little League team. Um, they're not going to do a lot of the political activities or even the marginally political activities they used to do because they don't want it used as a weapon against them. They don't want to take a stand that is going to perhaps alienate 50% of their customer base. Um, it, yeah, it and so they just want to be non-controversial. But I'm, but I'm with Fishy too. I want to know who is buying my politician. And that's where I like my congressman. He publishes that information. He just he makes more information public than he has to, but it's with the permission of his donors. And so then maybe that becomes an asset or an advantage that politicians do. It's like uh, you know uh, I'm running for office and I'm going to tell you everybody who's donated to me, and that makes me more transparent than the other guy, and it becomes a competitive advantage. Yeah, maybe, but your congressman is reelected with a very high re-election rate. He's also yeah. my congressman. He is yeah. in a completely safe seat. He has yeah. no downside to publishing this. What we're talking about in, say, Colorado, where there were lots of marginal uh, I chose victories. Well with my address, by the way. So, yeah. <laughs> I make no apologies for having a good congressman and living in a good district. <laughs> well, I'm not going to comment on that. Um, but in Colorado, there were a lot of not... Uh, you know, not very polarized districts. They were drawn a little differently, um, and there were very tight races, or races that shouldn't have been tight that became tight, um, yeah. in which that sort of thing did matter, would matter, and one or two percentage points in 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 polling through the election that could have been moved on a marginal issue like that does matter. Does. I think it's a bit of a catch-22 because as an individual, yeah, I don't really want everybody knowing exactly where I spend all of my political donations. But the flip side, for instance, out here in Colorado, fracking has been such a huge issue. Well, there were supposed to be some issues on the ballot, some pro, some anti, but they all got pulled. And the compromise was that Governor Hickenlooper was going to put together a 19-member panel to review all of the regulations on fracking. Well, that list just came out, and if you look at it, almost all of the people who will be sitting on this panel donated to his campaign. So... You know, yeah, and that gives you additional information about Hickenlooper and about the guys, and so it's, it's good, it's useful information to have... But yet, yeah, it's a really, it's a sticky issue. I, per, I personally, guys, and, and 
first of all, that's that's more on the idiocy of the people who made the deal with him. That's on them. Okay, that was such a stupid deal. Look, we were going to win the issue. Fracking, the pro fracking vote, it was going, it was going pro fracking. We were winning on the issue. And here we actually help the other side by let it die as an issue and then let him appoint a, a group. Well, that, that's great. That's like letting Obama appoint, you know, a 15-member panel telling us, you know, looking at our health care. Yeah, what could go wrong? Yeah, what could go wrong? You know, uh, hello, IRS. But, <laughs> you know, here is, to me it's this. Yes, I want to know where, who is giving to what. But I think... What if not, what if nobody did know? That would leave us going on their stances, what they say they'll do, what their past shows they do do. Okay. Yeah. And I think that that is plenty. I prefer that to turn to terrifying uh, businesses and people for the because their donations can be public. I would rather your donation, which indicates your political inclination, be just as private as your vote, and and let's and let's have people vote on the message, and the character of the person, and their and their track record, not on where the money's coming from. Even though I would like to know where that is as much as the next guy. I'm with you, except that I would rather people be bold enough to own their political convictions. <laughs> and that they would be able to withstand the criticism. It's a pipe dream, though. I know that's not going to happen. Not everybody is going to say, you know, screw it, I don't care what you think, this is what I am. Not everybody can afford to do that, and I understand it. I just wish it weren't so, and I know uh, wishes, you know, I'm always the one that tells people, you know, stop that, you know. It doesn't matter what you wish to be true, you have to deal with the ground where it is and, and the way it looks, and yet this is the one area in which I'm like, nah. Well, you, you know, but but here's the thing. Keep in mind, even with my system, they can voluntarily. I mean, if they if they want to let people know where they do, where they donate, they're free to do that. Well, and they put up this the sign in their yard and the right. sticker on their car. I mean, you can still voluntarily show people where you stand. I don't think it should be compulsory. Right. And and I feel that I feel that same way too. But then you also have to consider, as you know, we've had this discussion. I've I've remembered the fact that there were uh, claims of the Obama campaign uh, getting money from outside the country, getting you know money from from donors that are not in the United States of America. What about that? I, I, that's something I'm uncomfortable with. I'm uncomfortable with the prospect of outside money, not outside money like a corporation, but outside money like from China, like from you know, wherever, putting money into a campaign. And, and it's hard to uh, you know, figure that out. It's hard enough right now. I mean, we barely saw, I mean, nothing happened about that story, about the, uh, the app that the Obama campaign had out, or maybe it was uh, whatever his... Uh, uh, OFA organizing for America or organizing for Obama, whatever. It's really a difficult issue that I, you know. I, I don't know how we figure this out, but it's it's a good one to, to think about. Uh, well, on that on, on the OFA thing, the um, the Obama administration investigated the Obama administration and found that the Obama administration had not done anything wrong. So right. I'm, I'm confident that that that's okay. Right. No worries. Yeah. Um, moving from this free speech issue to another one, uh, I, I think. Well, I think it's free speech. I think it's a. It, it has a lot to do with with uh, freedom of expression and, and privacy as well. Uh, Fishy put this one up on Free Radical Network a little bit ago, and it caused a lot of consternation from a lot of folks. Uh, it's a reason. Uh, piece that was out that has some, some pretty interesting twists uh, to it, but it's about a woman whose kid was playing, you know, in the, in the on her street a little bit away from her house. A uh, cop comes, picks up the kid, oh, takes no. the kid to the door. I'm sorry, please go no. ahead. Yeah, you should let me tell this. <laughs> oh, yeah, here, here we go, yeah. 
Go on. Yeah. So the woman is um, at home. No one comes to the door ever except the UPS guy in the uh, evening. And she's uh, got a knock on the door, and a neighbor lady is standing there with her child, her six-year-old son, and uh, asks, you know, big smile on her face, is this your kid? Uh, yes. Uh, well, he was outside. Yes, he was playing outside. He would, no, you don't understand. I brought him home. Well, he was outside playing. Yes, I brought him home so he could be inside, supervised, with an adult. And the woman is like, okay, you are just freaking me out, you busybody. She smiled and she shut the door. Her kid, you know, as soon as he got to that door, he was gone, out of the way. And she was a little bit concerned about that. Oh, yeah, we've got some nosy neighbors, they're busybodies, do-gooders, whatever. Pretty soon a cop shows up to the door and asks about it and gets the story from her and, and uh, you know, okay, fine, well... Uh, you know, you probably don't want to uh, let the kids run around outside by themselves anymore. The kid was on a bench 150 yards maybe from the house that could be seen from the porch in a neighborhood that was billed as great for children, right? Playground at the end of the street, that sort of thing. And so then, you know, the cop leaves, everything's cool. The kid goes to bed at night afraid the cops are going to come because he can't go to sleep because he's passed up past his bedtime. Six-year-old minds are thinking interesting things. So a few days later, here comes CPS calling and saying they need to talk to her immediately. So she calls a lawyer. She gets, uh, gets all her things in order. She calls CPS back. They come. They do a home visit. They interview each of the children individually, unsupervised by a parent. This happened in Austin, Texas, by the way. This is not Connecticut. This is not Massachusetts. This is Austin, Texas. And so CPS comes through. They interview the children. They talk about the case. They decide that they, there's not a case there. They ask the children about whether they viewed pornography, whether they'd been abused, whether they'd been punished you know, in particular ways, how often they played outside, etc. When it was over... The mother asked the CPS person about it. You know, well, what am I supposed to do? Don't let your children play outside. That's the answer. And so she waited until the case was officially closed and then blogged about it. What's really interesting to me, I checked out her blog. She's a liberal. And not only is she a liberal who's now been stuck in the it takes a village trap, but she's a speechwriter for the Democrat candidate for lieutenant governor. How about them apples? When big government that you're trying to elect comes calling on you and attempts to take uh, your children away or goes through the process by which they could take your children away. Is that an example of someone being hoisted on their own petard? It sort of is, and I checked out her blog about this event, and she's full oh, like of older older articles to see what she had well, written before. This article that Reason wrote was picked up from her blog, and I read the whole thing on her blog, and it was very interesting because she's throughout the process of saying, I understand why they have to do this. I understand there are children that are abused. I understand the job of CPS is hard. She's bending over backwards to excuse it at the same time that it's terrifying her family. That's a horrible position to be in, isn't it? And I just thought, you know, it, I can't even enjoy the schadenfreude because right. I know someone to whom this has happened. Similar, similar case same thing, and a bus driver who saw their homeschooled children on the street waving goodbye to the other kids on the bus that were their friends, had CPS visits and all that, had to deal with that. It's insane. I can't even enjoy the schadenfreude. Not in my backyard. 
this stuff no, it, this stuff doesn't happen. So, I mean, it's okay. We need this because, I mean, it never gets used in ways that are harmful and that are scarring on kids. And you know, it's it's completely legit every time, 100% of the time. There is no failure rate at all. This also happened, by the way, in Pearland last year. And that's the other side of town from me. Um, that's an hour away. And this exact scenario, neighbor called because the kid's riding his bike up and down the street by himself, even though the kid is, you know, double-digit age, 10, 11. And the cops come out, and CPS has to get involved. And the thing that she makes, the point that she makes in this article is that the reporter is the person who's presumed to be believed over the people who are accused. And right. it do, we've talked about before swatting incidences where people have had their phone numbers, their home phones spoofed technologically and had the police or the SWAT teams called out saying somebody's there with a gun and then the people unbeknownst to them, the SWAT team's outside banging on their doors trying to get in, right? That's mm -hmm. a threat, that's a, a terroristic action that has been done to people. This is the same way. This can be used the same way against people. And guess what? You have a CPS file open and you have public records from interaction with officials and guess what? There you have someone's reputation potentially ruined because right. someone else decided to use that as a tactic for revenge and I think... What if she runs for office later or she ends up needing to get a divorce and she's going to lose custody of the kid? Yep. Um, yeah, because all of that becomes... that's, that's weaponized crap and... Uh, Swatting, the I saw a story about swatting recently that it's become a thing among gamers. That uh, the the guys that are doing the MMORPG games, they will call SWAT on their opponent so that their opponent gets knocked out of the game. Oh, and they'll they'll like record it for funsies when the SWAT team arrives. And some kid got like 25 years in prison for it. So that was cool. Uh, it's it's used in a lot of ways. Uh, I, I would, I would, say, and it has been used by gamers. That's that's something that that has been well documented and, uh, very early on in in the swatting thing that it was it was done. Uh, but it is absolutely unimaginable that this that this situation that these situations. I'm sorry. That that these situations uh, occur. And uh, and happen, you know. It, this is these aren't isolated incidences. These are these are things that happen all across the country to a lot of people, and you know that it takes actually being involved in it to to get this person's eyes open is horrendous. Where I wanted to go from there is because this happened specifically to not just a liberal, not just a, an activist, but a liberal political activist involved in a current campaign, is how we take this incident and talk about that overreach of government, how we talk about to the middle and to people on the left who are gettable on these issues like this. Um, You've talked before, JD, about everyone is a potential ally uh, on an issue. You might find a place to work with someone on just one issue, but you want to find those places and use them in that particular way, uh, and then you could drop them for the next thing or whatever. But I want to talk about that because how we can message this, how we can take these stories, these are personal stories. These are very gripping tales of, you know, children that are terrorized by the government um, and, and afraid in their own homes where they should feel safe with their parents, with whom they should feel safe. How do we message this so that we can reach more people about the overreach of government in this area? So many people are going to say it's about protecting children. It's about protecting children. You have to take some of these cases you know, in the interest of getting the ones in which children are truly beaten. Is that the case? Do we have to? Well, I just want to read out the line that Rob 
wrote here in the chat. I thought it was pretty good. Um, CPS, where an unelected government official can have an unsupervised conversation with your children and can take them away if they want. Government is great. Think about that. I mean, that was a, that's a pretty good summary there, Rob. Um, yeah, unelected government official can have an unsupervised conversation with your children and then take them away from you. Yeah, based you on what goes on, based on what goes on in that conversation. And look, look, wait. Something I want to stop and pause on that I didn't mention before. This is suburban Austin, right? Mm -hmm. What about families that don't have that sort of nice, great neighborhood for children, who have children in poor neighborhoods, and they get taken up by CPS? They're doing their best. The mother working at McDonald's, whose child was at the park playing with a cell phone handy and got reported. I mean, those people don't have the resources that this woman has, and right. she acknowledges it and calls it privileged in her piece, but those people don't have the sort of resources to defend against government the way that she does, so these policies are inordinately punitive towards the poor. Well, I've got a question for Andy, our, our pet former liberal. Uh, when there is something like this that happens that can cause, that is such a personal affront to your political beliefs. I mean, this woman, as Felicia has been saying, is involved in a liberal political uh, election right now. And now something is happening to her that is her preferred government against her. Is that the kind of thing that actually can change a liberal's mind? Is that the kind of thing that can start them on the path towards conversion? Or do they find a way to work their way around this cognitive dissonance? Well, the first thing is you don't you don't you use it as a see I told you so. Okay. Uh, yeah, you don't go to her and say, see, this is what your side does to you when you empower them or something like that. Oh right, because that's gonna make her push back. Right. They'll dig in their heels and they'll push uh -huh. back more. I think the best thing to do, and I gotta be honest, somebody who does this very well is Sean Hannity. Um when who, who, who is the uh, black gentleman um, who was on Sean Hannity's show quite a bit? And he made a comment on TV, and he got torn into uh, Juan... Juan Williams. Juan, Juan Williams. Yeah, do you guys remember that issue? There have been a couple of times that he strayed from the liberal reservation. Right, and he got attacked. And rather than say, this is what you get for this and this and this, Sean Hannity handled it like this. All he did was defend one. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, that look on J.D.'s face. All he did was defend Juan and leave it at that. Be the good guy on the right at that time when, by very definition, there are bad guys on the left. And so, in the case of this woman, you know, defend her, but don't, don't rub in the political point. Simply defend her and defend her right to liberty, and even play it up and say, and say this is a good person. She knows what to, what to do for her children. She knows, and you should trust her. I trust her, and so forth. That's going to make a much deeper impact on her. Being conservatives ride to her defense when perhaps maybe some liberals aren't. Exactly, and and the nice thing about that is, then later when we ride to a conservative's defense, we're consistent. Right. But at no point did we try to say, don't ever let this, uh, you know, a, a, an emergency or whatever go to waste. We didn't play their game. We played a better game. We made their game look bad with our game. Got Absolutely, it. and that's that's something that's vital. But instead, you're going to get a lot of people who go, ha ha, serves are right. There's very few things that are worse to do than saying "ha ha" serves her right. That is yeah. just the, and, and that's you know that that goes back into the same thing with the with the uh, with the pictures with the uh, new photographs that we talked about uh, episodes ago. And the point Never, scoring and some of that, yeah. Yeah, it's it's point scoring. It's all of those things. Don't say "ha ha" serves her right because it makes it does absolutely nothing for you. And it shouldn't even make you feel good because it doesn't it doesn't do anything, it doesn't accomplish anything, it just makes you sound like a jerk. Well, and and I'm guilty there because I'm the one who went digging specifically for that information on her blog because mm -hmm. we're talking Austin, 
mother and you know I was putting two and two together because I live here um, but at the same time the reason story I don't think mentions any of that no. I thought they handled that well um, here I've done let the cat out of the bag but at the same time it was to make that greater point that that I want to move that conversation into the arena where we can talk to people like that who won't hear us in our normal um, I guess in our normal uh, chambers of communication that we have so it, it was only relevant in that I felt it was a place of connection um, I still feel guilty for saying it but only a little um, but well, and, you know. and why does why does parenting have to be a right left issue why does the the rights of a parent to allow free range children um, why does that have to be conservative liberal well and can we talk about how much more important it is to have free range children than it is to have free range ch chicken <laughs> people will be all down with animal cruelty and I get that I understand it I, I, I completely sympathize with that but meanwhile we're so village get them children in a cage get right. them children in a cage just it reminds me Oh, go ahead, Andy. I'm sorry. Nikki used to saying "free range chicken." I just picture people lassoing them and riding after herd of chicken. <laughs> you chicken don't know that's how it's done. I'm a suburbanite, okay? None of this makes sense to me, and I'm going to have nightmares. Well, and you went to Dallas, so that's not really Texas. That's sort of you know big city. So you know, <laughs> we didn't show you our free chicken range, children ranges either. Parenting <laughs> children ranges. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That used to be called the neighborhood. The yeah, right. Hey, my oh. gosh, I think all of our parents would have been arrested if these standards oh, were. Oh my! Oh my! my. Good grief! I mean, it used to be the norm of mom was like, "It's a beautiful day. Get out of here. I don't want to see you until." Yes. And come now, on, come home when the street lights turn on. That was always the right. rule. You could play outside. It, it didn't matter, and the neighbors looked out for each other, and they made sure that nothing bad would happen. But now it's like people just want to use this. It's like they just want to hurt people. Guys, mm -hmm. if if I can say two things, first of all, and first silly and then serious. Silly, I, I just think we all need to commend JD right now for not bringing up Adrian Peterson during this entire parenting discussion. I, for you not to bring up the most obvious football analogy, I, the restraint shown there, I mean... And that's Texas are, as well. Adrian are, is also a Texan. There are people who spend 20 years teaching abstinence to teenagers who have less restraint than you just showed. <laughs> anyway, uh, the second... I, <laughs> I had to say because I just can't believe you didn't do it. And the uh, second thing is, the reason parenting becomes so political is because there is nothing more political than parenting. And here's why. Remember, politics is all about the war of choice versus control, of right versus left. And do you want to control your own life and raise your own kids, or do you want to control the lives of others and raise theirs? And with this woman, I would want to convey the message that I always want to convey. I want to control my own life, not yours. I don't want to control how you raise your kids. Okay, I want to. I want control over how I raise my own, not how you raise yours. And that sends a heck of a message going the other way. But it has to become political because the left absolutely does want to raise your kids. And and, and in fact, what they do with schools is the most controlling thing I can possibly imagine. Taking tax dollars from people of all beliefs, and then teaching almost entirely one side with public schools raising your kids. There, I don't know of any other group that does anything more controlling. Yeah, I mean, F Fishy, you, sa you look like you have something to say there. I'm still working on it. Okay. Um, well, me being somebody who is a good example, I guess, of, of free-range parenting, um, like, I, I was homeschooled. I was allowed to play in my backyard. I don't know if backyards are illegal to, to for kids to play in. I have a big backyard, so you know somebody could just see into our backyard and, and and see that there's a kid out there in the middle of the backyard. Oh no, all by himself playing, not supervised. 
uh, I, I, that that's a question. That's actually a legitimate question that I have. Where is the line here? If there are kids playing, if if you have a kid that's playing, you know, basketball in in the backyard, and there's no parent in sight, is that illegal? Is that something that that should be uh, that should be that the that the snitches should come up and start narking on you to uh, to the cops because? Um, there's a kid playing basketball by himself in the backyard. Is that is that illegal now? I'm I'm sitting here thinking now that I'm partly guilty for this, that I'm partly responsible the way I raised my oldest child. Um, it I went through hell to get the child here, and when she was growing up, I wasn't going to let anything happen to her. Um, she nearly died at a very young age, and. Uh, it was a you know a life flight situation and and she was fine. Uh, shortly thereafter, they couldn't find anything wrong, but it was just she stopped breathing and um, so I've always been you know very nervous about her. And so when the kids would go out and play, all the kids in the neighborhood, I'd be the mom out there with the lawn chair. No matter where they were, I was the grown up, and all the other parents would let their kids come out and and I'd watch the children, uh, and they knew I would be there. Um, I'm I'm feeling kind of responsible now. There were very few times that she was, you know, out there where I wasn't with an earshot. Now they were all over the neighborhood, but I was out there where they could see me and I could see them. Um, so now we know that you started. I the did whole it. Friend. I so I did it. There's a huge difference between what you what you said and what happened here. You were watching these kids. You had your eye on them to make sure that they were okay and that if anything bad happened that somebody was there. That's completely opposite from what this neighbor did. This neighbor brought the kid home and said, you know, and then and then told the cops or whatever that this kid was allowed to to be out on the street and somehow that that's about you were I think it's were related being though. passive. There's there's a difference between being being passive and aggressively going and and taking this kid back to their house and saying you can't be out here, you know, Dikembe Mutombo on this kid's phone. I think it's related because I think, you know, Fishy made the choice, she made her own choice to supervise her own children, but then if she were, the the busybody lady um, made the choice to, prob probably made the choice to supervise her own children and then assumed that everyone else must be the exact same way. So when she saw the neighbor lady across the street not supervising her child, she reported that as a problem because the lady across the street was not as helicopterish as she was. It's it's kind of a of a thing of everyone must be exactly like me and if they're not I'm going to call the cops. It's a, a it's a kind of an instinct to enforce your own opinion and your own beliefs on everybody else that we've kind of gotten to. And it's weird because you tell people this story, you you explain what happened, and 99 times out of 100, you're going to get shock and disbelief out of your person that you're talking to, and that's not across political lines. That's, I, I mean, that's not just in your, in your own group. That's normal people regardless of political ideology and yet the one person the one person who's nannyish is the one carrying all the weight here and I mm -hmm. wonder if that's not a part built into the system kind of the kind of the heckler's veto one person the even the fear of offending one person changes our behavior and this one person who went crazy when she saw a kid riding the riding his bike down the street, she has the she is given the power to control the police, CPS. I mean, she's setting the schedule for all of these people. Well, and I right. think that that's this goes back to what I was saying earlier that these you can use CPS as a weapon against someone. Just one offhand accusation, and look at all the problems that were caused. This woman is obviously a responsible parent. She was letting her child play outside. She wouldn't do that if it wasn't safe. Fish, Fishy said it was considered to be a really great neighborhood for kids. But yet, I think that's where the system is just broken. Because why is it that just one comment, one observation from a complete stranger can just destroy this family's lives? And now they're having to look over their shoulder all the time. 
here's what she says at the end of her blog piece. Um, for now, we stay in the house, and we try not to fall victim to fear like everyone else. We try not to be afraid of the outside world. We try to learn from our privilege, which is that she had the, the lawyer on tap and all the resources to deal with this effectively. We try not to be daunted by the view perspective affords us. We just try really, really hard. Apparently, she's moving. When they can sell their house, they're out of that neighborhood until they can find a place that's more hospitable. But she says, do hospitable neighborhoods even exist anymore? Well, I can tell you it's are. Sad. <laughs> I mean, I personally think it's a great thing when I see kids outside playing. We have had some instances in our neighborhood where there are really little kids outside playing on a busy entrance way to the neighborhood. And so there are some people who have voiced concerns because the ki they're kids. They don't understand that if they're sitting on a skateboard and they're going down the little hill and there's a car parked on the corner that I can't see them as I'm coming around the corner in my car. And they almost went right underneath my car. So what did I do? I stopped and I scolded them. And I said, girls, I couldn't even see you. I hope you never, ever, don't you ever let me see you do that again because I'll go talk to your mother about it. But I wasn't going to call CPS or the sheriff's office to turn them in. That is a huge point. I, I need, to, I need to, 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 to go into this right now because maybe that's the problem here. Maybe the thing is, is that instead of the responsibility being on this, the, the woman who, who brought the kid over to the uh, to the parents' house, instead of the responsibility of saying, hey, I don't think that your kid should be out here, instead of her saying it to this woman's face, she instead punted on it, said, okay, this isn't my job. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to give this woman my opinion. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to this third party and have them enforce my opinion on them. No, she gave her the opinion, and then she went and got reinforcements from the police and CPS, technically. But I think the point is is still valid. You know, in general, we're having people who are not going to have that conversation, and in some cases, they would want to be anonymous. And so you have an anonymous, unaccountable person who, you know, who knows how well the authorities vet them, making accusations and they can remain anonymous. Right, but doesn't this go back to the whole we don't get to know our neighbors and we don't take an interest in each other anymore because it's easier to push it off on a third party? Right, and if I want to impose my view on the neighborhood, whether it's, you know, the couple down the street who plays the music too loud or whatever, instead of calling them and talking to them, I'm just going to call the cops. I'm just going to call CPS, whatever. You know, I, I just think it's ironic how this woman has somebody exert control over her and she immediately shuts down, shuts down her life, is terrified, and wants to leave. And yet she would be the first one who does not understand why conservatives are constantly the ones who want to secede from this state or that to get away from liberals wanting to control their lives. Why um, businesses that are smothered by, um, that constantly have things like the EPA or every other group trying to out them and get them in trouble, want to go overseas or go anywhere else to create a job. You know, I would be nice. I would be very nice up front and to her, and I would uh, tell everybody in the world she's a great parent. But at some point, yeah, I would look, I would look at, at people and say, but look how she responded to control. Isn't this how businesses feel? Isn't this how everyone feels? When we try to control their lives, they want to shut down and get away from us. I would use it for that point. I really would. Maybe that's shallow of me. Maybe that's mean. No, I think that's a really good place to take it. Yeah. Using it to uh, using it as an illustration and, and uh, bringing up other examples of how the government is exerting its control on people. I mean, talk about uh, codes, talk about regulations when it comes to small businesses. I mean, there's a ton of this stuff that is specious and, and, and tiny and, you know, things that should not be lawsuits 
that get to be lawsuits for no good reason. It's it's just this is a this is a gateway discussion to have into bigger, uh, more controlling situations. I, I think that that is that that it's absolutely super useful, uh, particularly when you're talking to uh, your friends, talking to local people, talking to uh, you know people who are not necessarily involved in the political process. It's it's a good way to introduce them to hey, this is this is something that happened. And can you believe it? And here's some other examples of this type of stuff happening. Talk about the the kids who can't uh, have lemonade stands. You know, there there's just it goes into a and and how that how they get in trouble. How you know they can face criminal charges for starting up those kinds of businesses. You know, there are a lot of these stories that we can line up and use as fodder to explain to people that control coming from the government, it's harmful. Well, and it oversteps common sense, too. And I think that's where the common ground really is. Because when you talk about some little kid who wants to start a lending library in his neighborhood or start a lemonade stand, and they're shut down by government authorities for just trying to be nice or trying to share, people look at that and they're like, that's insane. And so, like you said, J.D., if you can find that area of common ground and then start talking about, okay, well, so how do you feel about having a government that is trying to control these kids with, you know, trying to share, you have to have a permit in order to share. It really opens up some interesting doors. Yeah, and it's up to us to get in there, to get in those doors and actually uh, make these points because these are points that matter and they're not political points, they're not points that are worthless. These are common sense points that actually get people to move on an issue. So. And how many people face issues like this every day that we don't even know their stories. We don't know about it. It's a headline in the newspaper and because it's written the way it is, we're like, oh, well, they must be guilty. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and how many people know other people? You know, that, that's another thing is that these these things happen, and just because you don't see it doesn't mean that they don't. And people have family members who've gone through this. You know, they themselves might have been involved in this, and, and you know, talking about divorces, talking about all sorts of things that are messy that get child protective services involved. There's a lot of ways that uh, these issues affect people, and we don't talk about them because immigration is more important or because you know there we we put our we talked about this with extron last week we put so much re, so many of our resources into issues that are not going to get us traction and we don't put enough resources into issues that can get us people that can win us uh, new new voters new people uh, who you know would otherwise either vote left or just not participate because these are important issues to people they they care about uh, you know these stories they care about their co-op getting raided by FDA SWAT teams they care about that stuff it's it's just we don't seem to, to want to talk about these for these stories for whatever reason I don't get it but Reason Magazine, Reason TV, they seem to be the only guys that really want to get into these stories and talk about just how crazy uh, the government is. There's one more part that I wanted to read real quick because it broke my heart. I was also warned, the neighbor can call CPS as many times as she wants. If she truly feels there's neglect, she can't be prosecuted for false allegations. We could try to sue her for harassment. We could try to press charges of kidnapping if she approached our son again and tries to get him to move from where he's playing. But in all reality, when children are involved, the person who makes the complaint gets the benefit of the doubt. Hey, once again, let me compare that. And yet I guarantee she opposes loser pays. Legislate right. where because without loser pays legislation, the accusers can accuse, 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 and all they got to do is find lawyers who will go in on a percentage basis. 
and if they can win and squeeze some money out of a business they accused, the lawyer gets a percentage. Um, loser pays legislation would say if you if your lawsuit against that business or person is found to be frivolous, if you're just launching empty accusations, then you must pay the cost of their legal fees up to the cost of yours, you know, equal to the cost of yours. You have to take some risk in launching accusations against people. And, which, by the way, I think is a fantastic law. It would be the and that's the English system, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it would be the greatest thing in the in the history of the insurance industry. I can tell you that right now. Mm -hmm. For our costs, uh, if you want to lower uh, health care costs, that is the best way, right there, loser pays. But the thing is, is that here, this woman really wishes there was basically what loser pays some risk involved with the accusers. Right. There so they can accuse all they want without limit. And she's upset about that. That translates exactly over to loser pays in every other area of life. Well, what I'm beginning to wonder is, are some of these discussions the kind of thing that we can put out under a heading of what are the dangers of big government? Because we've discussed before that, uh, particularly the millennials, they don't really understand what we mean by big government. They don't understand how big government is scary and bad. Um, is this the kind of thing that can come under the heading of what are the dangers of big government? It's an inflexible bureaucracy that has to have a police officer come visit you and if it's about children the police officer is required by law to bring in CPS who is required by law to interview your children and ask them questions about porn, mu porn movies even when Everybody all along the way knows all it is is a is a mean neighbor who wanted to get you in trouble. The law, the government, and the bureaucracy requires all of this, and this is this is how big government is dangerous. This is how it hits home. And then, and then another, what are the dangers of big government? Well, it's a it's a lemonade stand that you can't have. It's a lending library that you can't start. Is it is it kind of illustrations of what are the dangers of big government to try to get that message across? Um, well, Leslie, I'm not sure if they would follow all of that. Um, if you're talking specifically about millennials, because most millennials have had helicopter parenting experiences where they have been supervised every single minute of the day, and their day has been completely structured. So I think if we could simplify it, then it could work. Um, and I see your line of logic, but I don't know if all of that would sink in. Mm, yeah, you're I, right. Yeah. I try to keep the uh, keep the enemy being simply control. You, you can personalize that. You don't like me. You don't like uh, you know. You don't like the micromanaging boss if you work at a pizza parlor. You don't like you know what I mean. You don't like the overbearing boss, overbearing parent, overbearing teacher, overbearing. Uh, alpha dog in your group at school, overbearing anybody. You don't like anyone controlling how you live, okay? And then, having set that table, then you can talk about government. Well, nothing is more powerful to control you than, and then you can bring up government. But what I do is I still say the big enemy is not the government, it's the people who use it to control you. So think about, you know, think about... Uh, you don't like this uh, overbearing parent, overbearing uh, teacher, overbearing friend, whatever. Now, what if they had the government? What if they had the government doing their bidding to control you? <laughs> and could actually, could, you know, the nice thing about that parent, teacher, friend, or whatever is they only see you a few minutes a day or at these intervals. The government's with you all the time. What if they actually had the government controlling you? So start personal, expand it then to what if they were empowered in that way. Does that help at all? Yeah. I'm still uh, yeah, and I I still I'm always looking for the way to tie it back to something that is an obviously conservative line of messaging, so therefore vote Republican. I mean, I always want to get the person to understand and you agree with me and you're all on on target, and so that means vote Republican. You know, I always kind of want to get there, and it's, it's not—it's not really obvious. Yeah, it's—it's a—it's a long process, though. So that's another thing to remember. 
But I ain't got time for a long process. I want to. I want to work the whole, you know, next election and then go back to sleep for another year and a half until it's time to get worried about the next election and then go back to sleep for. Actually, yeah. a quick hard sell comes off as controlling, and it, and and yeah. it, it undermines your message. What I do is I simply go against control, go against uh, go go against control personally, and then say. Now, unlike that person, government can be everywhere. What if that? What about people who use government to control you? Okay, and then if you know if you're embroiled and the, you know, they're enraptured in the discussion or whatever, yeah, then you can make a political point. If not, you can leave it right there. The key is don't control them and go for the quick sell. That angers them and and, and undermines yeah. your. Leave it there, because always leave them wanting more. And the and they're gonna want to know. I've actually you know done that and had people ask, well, what party do you like? <laughs> I've had that happen a lot. Well, this one, this is why. It's not perfect, but it doesn't control my life anywhere close to near as much. You know, something that Andy said made me uh, track on an article I'd read. I just put it in the chat. Um, how your innocent smartphone passes almost your entire life to the Secret Service. And it was an experiment done by uh, someone in, in Europe who was, uh, for a week, uh, consciously aware that, the, that not only a official tracking, but some uh, other tracking from a magazine that he worked for, uh, we're going to follow everything and try to cobble his week together based on metadata alone. It was fascinating. And when you consider what they did, just you know, these guys with the guy being aware and changing his behavior as little as possible, um, and then being able to have that analysis posted and you could see what he'd done for the whole week. It's a really fascinating read. Uh, I know we don't have time to get into it, but it made me think about how much the government has um, access to this sort of thing, and especially if you're in a, a case where the government is, is already looking at you for something, how much of your life they can dig up and how much control they can exercise over what you do there by uh, pulling all that data together. Would it be if, would it be effective, Fishy, to, to ask a young person, hey, two quick questions. Number one, would you like, say, your parents or the government or someone in charge to literally know everywhere you went in the last month, all the places you went? Well, no, I wouldn't. Okay, second question. Do you bring your cell phone virtually everywhere? That is powerful. That is powerful. Think about it. Toll booths. Toll, uh, you know, they could read that sort of thing based on, you know, where you're getting your toll paid. They're going to track that. Um, but not, I mean, not just your cell phone, but all the other things you do. Um, you know, the way that cell towers pick you up, no matter where you are. That sort of thing. It's insane. And, and I don't think people, I think people are so, enjoy, so much enjoying the technology, they don't think about that other side of it. Um, but putting it in a stark analysis like that, you know, everywhere you've been, all the places. What about the free clinic? You've been over to the free clinic, you want your mom to know that you were there, that sort of thing, you know. Well, and they're yeah. and they're talking about mandating chips in cars. That some some people are putting chips in their cars because it decreases their insurance rates. Um, and but they're talking about uh, having that be mandated by the federal government. And maybe maybe that even has passed and starts in 2016. I'm not really sure. I don't follow it. But then at that point, then the government can see how fast you were driving and did you really come to a full and complete stop at that stop sign and they'll be able to have their computers come up with a profile of well she's a safe driver but she goes to this and she goes to the exact same bank branch every week every Wednesday at 3 and you know if you if you watch the show person of interest yeah it's real mm. they'll be able to analyze and predict and determine and it'll all be legal We've agreed to it because of terrorism. 
and we're money. and we're spending money to make ourselves safe, and it's not making us safe. The money's being spent, but not effectively. And then when we need them to spend the money effectively, they ask for more money. And it's like we we gave you a big pile of money. What did you do with it? Oh well, we spent it way over there on. TSA agents who don't do anything. So we need, if you want us to really make you safe, you need to give us some more big pile of money so that we can do the right thing. And, you know, it's why every single time we need to spend billions of dollars for roads and bridges, but the roads and bridges never get fixed because the money that, you, that we give them for roads and bridges goes to pay for fake solar cell factories and all of those kinds of things. We've signed our own search warrants really we've agreed to all of this how do we how do we put the genie back in the bottle it reminds me of the article or the theory of three felonies a day I think there's an author that mm -hmm. wrote a book on that whole thing it reminds me of that we are getting so much government that eventually they're going to have automated sentencing you know based on what you do and you were talking about did you stop the stop sign red light cameras already do that it's not criminal mm -hmm. They can't pass them criminally because you need an officer there in most cases to to actually make um, make them. They call them uh, uh, moving violations or whatever, and and they can issue you civil fines um, for doing things that no one saw you do, but they caught it on a camera. I I thought that it was only a loss of down for moving violations, fifteen yards. You no. sports did. I'm sorry. Um, and that's that's a moving violation. He sports did. Exactly. Uh, it would be nice if they spent more time focusing on, I don't know, maybe killing the bad guys and not spying on me. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe I would, you know, just possibly that could be a way to, to take care of things, killing the bad guys and not spying on us. It would be nice. Uh, you would we, have... We'd... Spend less. You would spend less money on spying on us because you wouldn't have to spy on us because the bad guys would be dead. Spend the money wisely. I think we've proven as a society that we're perfectly willing to spend a big old pile of money for government to do a lot of things. We want. We're we're willing to spend a lot of money for government to keep people from being too terribly poor, and to keep people from being too terribly unemployed or or too terribly hungry. Um, we're perfectly willing to spend a whole lot of money for the government to fix our roads and bridges and to protect our borders and to protect us from terrorists. We're giving them the money. They're asking for it. We give it to them. They're not doing what they say they're going to do. And then they come back and ask us for more money. If they were a corporation, we give them money. They say they're going to provide a service. They don't provide the service. They go out of business. But because it's a government, we give them money to provide a service. They don't provide the service. They ask for more money. We give them more money. You say ask. I don't think I don't think ask is the right no. word. No, and we re-elect them. They ask. We elect them. We are collectively as a nation. We are re-electing these guys over and over and over again. They ask. I mean, they're not. They're not There's, forcing us. We are electing them. Yeah, but but they're demanding the cash. So uh, I, there there are some there's some force involved there. I I, I won't go all Adam Kokesh here, but there's, there's some there's some <laughs> thank you. There's some force there's some force involved with that with that money going from our pockets to theirs. So uh, yeah. And ultimately, of, every government transaction is enforced at the end of a gun. Sorry. I had to get it out. I, I, just don't know why they, I just don't know why their supporters get to vote themselves my money. I, I'm really sick of it. Guys, can you please tell me the difference between overwhelming people with votes to take their money, the difference between that and looting? I don't get it. I don't either. Fewer bricks? Uh, it's it's less honest. It's less straightforward. You know, at least the looters will look at you in the will look you in the eye and say, "I'm going to break your window and I'm going to steal your stuff." And some are very nice. They'll be, I'm, "I'll be your looter today." <laughs> and, 
I was really shocked that time. I didn't see it coming, but I was so so happy. I just gave him a lot of stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, speaking of, of keeping people's jobs uh, and all of that, uh, we're getting around to the end of of the of the episode, I believe. Yes, I believe we are. Does anybody have any other topics that they absolutely have to bring up today? No, but or I had a final quote. Cool. I had a final yep. quote as soon as it pulls up. And it goes right along with what um, uh, Andy was saying. And it's a C.S. Lewis quote. Of all tyrannies, a tyranny sincerely exercised for the good of its victims may be the most oppressive. It would be better to live under robber barons than under omnipotent moral busybodies. The robber baron's cruelty may sometimes sleep. His cupidity may at some point be satiated, but those who torment us for our own good will torment us without end, for they do so with the approval of their own conscience. Woo! Well you know, one thing about robber barons is that they never assume they never take it upon themselves to assume what our good is. And I like that alone. Yes. I am a fan of robber barons in that context. Yes. Because they're just doing it for themselves. Yes. Like, I'm taking your money because it makes me happy. I don't, it, I don't care what it does to you. I like that. That's, that's good selfishness or something? I, I don't know. And they might eventually leave you alone if they don't think you have anything more to give. Wouldn't that be nice? So... so the message is we need to elect robber barons. Okay, let's get on that. I totally said that. <laughs> <laughs> and let's see, next week there will be even more insanity, right? <laughs> it's an interesting note to leave us on. So anyway, that will finish up the episode for today. And I want to thank everybody who was here on chat and everybody who was watching us live. And... In advance, everyone who's going to watch the clips that are published throughout the week that JD and Felicia work so hard on. Um, thank you very much. We will be back next Tuesday at 8.30.